Hello everyone and welcome to Living Coast in your living room. My name is Ashley. I'm one of the educators here at the Living Coast Discovery Center. Every day here on Facebook, Monday to Friday, we're bringing you all kinds of different interactive opportunities for you to learn about nature and all the amazing things within it. Now, for those of you who have never been down to the Living Coast Discovery Center, we are a small nonprofit zoo and aquarium located down in Chula Vista, uniquely situated on the San Diego Bay National Wildlife Refuge. Now we know it can be hard staying home during this time, so we're doing our best to bring all of our amazing animals and different facts about nature into your homes. Be sure to join us here on Facebook Monday to Friday at 11 a.m. or you can watch later at your own time on our YouTube channel as well. Now today, we're actually going to be focusing on tide pools. We're also going to be exploring how diverse those tide pools can be and how scientists go about doing that. Now, what is a tide pool? Do you know what a tide pool is? A tide pool is the result of the ever-changing shorelines from the ocean. As the ocean is having waves going back and forth, it changes our shorelines a lot. And this is going to be due to something in the sky which causes all of those waves and the tides to move forward and backwards. Do you know what that is? Well, that's actually gonna be caused by the moon and the sun. The gravitational pull of the sun and the moon is what actually is influencing our ocean currents to have those tides. So did you know that the sun does still pull on our ocean? It's not as strong as our moon pulling onto it, as our sun is much farther away. So the strength from the gravitational pull of the moon is about 50% stronger than that of the sun's. So it has a huge influence on the way our tides react. Now, as this happens, we actually experience two different high tides a day and two different low tides a day, generally in that 24 hour period. As the earth is rotating around, that moon is going to be in another position and that's going to actually impact the tides and that's why we have high tide where the water comes up onto that shoreline and then low tide when the water goes back out and as that happens it often leaves behind water in different depressions in the sand or even in rocky crevices and these are what we call tide pools now within these tide pools we can find all kinds of different things ranging from different animals to even different plants there's a lot of different stuff that you can find inside of a tide pool. And part of that is due to the changing nature of the intertidal zone. As it's always changing, it's always fluctuating, there are different animals that go up with the high tide and then end up getting stuck in those pools waiting for the next high tide to return. Now today, we are gonna to get to build our own tide pool as you can see here, I have little boxes in front of me, and this is part of how we're going to build our own tide pools today. Now, one of the ways that scientists actually go out and study tide pools is to do what's called transects. Transects are where you go out on a designated line. It can be a physical line like a rope, or it could just be a line where you acknowledge it and say, I'm gonna walk straight through here. And they stop periodically and put down different things like a circle or a square, or even sometimes a rectangle and look inside of that quadrate and examine what they can find inside of it. So that's what we're going to be doing today is we're gonna be making our own little transect quadrants. So I have three of them right here with me with different varieties of different stuff. So if you would like to make your own, all you have to do is find some type of box. You can make one or you can make multiple, whatever it is you would like to do. You can find a couple of different boxes and then you're gonna to wanna to put some substrate in it. So in mine, I have some sand. So just something that you can use to be able to hide some different parts inside of it. Some great options include things like dirt, you could use Easter grass, actual grass, leaves, twigs, even things like cotton balls or even a towel. You can use all kinds of different things just to make it as your main substrate. Then you're gonna hide different things inside of your tide pool. And that's how you're gonna be able to see what you're gonna find. So I have a couple of different types of shells of different animals that I have inside of mine. So you can use all kinds of different things. So this one is like a snail shell. Most of these are snail shells actually, but lots of different types of snails. 
So for yours, you could use things like buttons or sequins. You could use marbles, cotton balls, even Q-tips. Any household item will work for you to make your own tide pool. And this is how you're gonna be able to study diversity. Species diversity is gonna let you know how many different types of animals or plants, depending on what you're studying, are gonna be found in a given area. This is really important when you're looking at tide pools so you can see what is gonna be found in your intertidal zone so you can keep a good track of what's going to be in your local area. Now, often in our areas here in San Diego, we get to find things like crabs, where you can see some of these shore crabs. These guys are not usually super big, so you can see they're next to a quarter here and a penny down here, so not super big animals. You can also find things like wavy top snails. If you remember a couple of weeks ago on Living Coast in your living room, we actually met one of these guys as well. Now this one's a little trickier. Can you see that? This is going to actually be a hermit crab. We do have small local species of hermit crabs too here in San Diego. So you could even find uh, hermit crabs in our tide pools. And of course, things like sea stars. So there's lots of different animals that you can find inside of our tide pool. And that's why it's important to be checking out this diversity. This is a giant keyhole limpet. Do you see that hole on the top of it? That's what scientists thought looked like a keyhole, so they called it the keyhole limpet. So these are all great examples of common animals that you can find in a tide pool here in San Diego. Now these are not what you're gonna find inside of your DIY ones, but they're still great opportunities for you to see what kinds of animals you can find. So to build your tide pool box, you're gonna to wanna to take your box, put your materials in it, and then cover it with that substrate. I have three different ones here, and I have them labeled as site A, B, and C. Site A, B, and C are all different locations along the beach that we sampled, so we collected the sand and collected whatever organisms would have been living there at different tide heights. So site A is actually at the zero foot tide line, so right on that water line. Site B is actually at the negative two feet. That means the tide was negative, so it's farther back by two feet. So that means it was a very low, low tide. And then site E is a positive two feet, so that would have been a high tide. So scientists will do this at different times in the same location to see what kind of animals are thriving during high tide, low tide, and average tide, and kind of in between the times. So what's going on? throughout the day. And these are great ways to be able to check for abundance of animals, species richness, if there's a lot of different kinds, as well as that diversity. So you can check to see all kinds of different animals that are living inside of your tide pool area. Now, the other thing we talked about is going to be creating these tide pool transects. And we attach these worksheets for you so that you can actually learn a little bit more. So this first sheet gives you step-by-step -step directions of how you can go through it. And then on the back two pages are gonna be what you're gonna use to record what you find. So this one is pre-written out with different information based off of my tide pool. But this one is blank, so you can fill it in. So under species name, that's where you would write down whatever objects you found and are using to simulate in your tide pool. So if you're using buttons or beads or beans, that's what you would write down here. And then these are going to be your different site locations here. So it's pre-filled in as tide heights, but you could change it to whatever you would like, making as many boxes as you think necessary. And this is how you go through your box, counting and checking out what it is you have. So I'm going to go through this one here and we can see. So inside of my box, I'm going to take it and let you guys get a chance to check it out shake it around a little bit. You can see there's all kinds of different stuff in there, right? Now, I don't know what everything is in here, so I also have these species ID cards to help me to identify what it is I'm looking at. So what you wanna do is you're gonna take out some items and you're gonna look at it. And you'll go through these cards and you'll say, hmm, what kind of snail is this? I know that this is a snail shell because of its shape and how it has the opening right here. 
So that makes it a snail. So then I can go through my list and I will identify with my cards which type of snail this is and record it on my sheet. And I would count as many of these snails as I can find. There's a lot of sand and this snail shell just keeps falling out. So yeah, I would go through and I would pull these out and count as many of these ones as I can find. Then I would pull out the next one and do the same thing, but this is a different animal. This one is much smaller and looks more in line like a mussel. So then I'm gonna go through my species ID cards and find out which one is a mussel to identify for my species diversity and record in my transect. So this is not a really hard activity to do. It's really easy and you can do it in a variety of different ways. So you can make one box, you can make three boxes, or you can make seven boxes and you make them all different. So as you count the different pieces in each box, then you can get an idea of how diverse your box is going to be. Now, although these are not real tide pools, tide pools are very important for us to have out there as they do provide homes to a variety of different animals, especially those marine invertebrates, and they do rely heavily on those. So if you go out tide pooling, that's totally fine. You just wanna make sure that you're doing so safely and being aware of your surroundings. So the best way to go tide pooling is going to be to walk out very slowly and carefully, making sure that you're giving the animals the chance to run away if they choose to do so, and then making sure you're not stepping on any of them. That's one of the biggest issues that tide pools are facing out there is as humans go into them, they don't always think that those things are alive. They don't realize that the plants are actually living organisms or the corals that are growing are so fragile. So when we step on things, we can actually cause a lot of damage. So it's important to make sure you are watching where you're stepping. And if you pick something up like a cool snail shell, you want to make sure you put it back. Now, we don't need that snail shell, but what about that hermit crab we talked about? That hermit crab might need that shell so that it can keep growing. So we want to make sure we leave everything where it is. And when you pick up things like rocks and stuff, you set them back down and leave them in the place that they came from. Because these are homes for all these different animals. So we want to make sure we're doing our best to leave them right there. Now the best way to remember how to properly tide pool is to take only pictures and leave only footprints. This makes it the best way for you to be able to go out and tide pool safely, still get to see all the different animals and different organisms that are thriving in those environments, but allowing them the chance to continue to do so. So by making sure you take only pictures and leave only footprints, you can make sure you have a successful tide pooling adventure. All right, guys, thanks for joining us here today on Living Coast in your living room. We are talking about how to make these DIY tide pools. It's very simple and easy, so not super intense. And then I'm going to show you guys some different animals that we have found around in our area. So we have things like our sand dollars here. You can see they have those characteristics. Do you know what colored sand dollars actually are when they're living? So seeing a living sand dollar versus this one here, this is going to be the skeleton of a sand dollar. They're very different. So sand dollars are actually purple when they're living and they kind of look like they have hairs growing across them, but that's actually gonna be their skin and how they're able to move. Good job, Sarah, they are purple. <laughs> awesome. This is actually a sea urchin test. So this is the skeleton of a sea urchin. This is what's left behind. And this is where all those spines grow out of. So you can see there's holes in it, go straight from the top through to the bottom. And this is actually where the mouth would be. The mouth of a sea urchin is called an Aristotle's lantern. And that's what sea urchins do is they crawl across the bottom of the ocean floor very slowly. Then they'll use their mouth and they'll start eating things like kelp. It's one of their favorite things. Now on this test, does it look like it has a bunch of spines on it? No, it doesn't, but it does have bumps running along its entire body here. And that's actually where those spines would grow out of. And that's what helps protect them. And then previously we learned about sea stars, but these are all examples of animals that you can see inside of a tide pool. So whenever you go out next, you can make sure 
that you are watching out for any of these amazing creatures that live there in the tide pool environments. Now, as always, if you guys have any questions, feel free to comment those below. We'd love to hear from you and answer any of those questions you might have. But thanks for joining us here today on Living Coast in Your Living Room. We'll see you next time.